9.30 p.m., a lead plane pilot spotted a small escaped picnic fire on the Chewick River, about 30 miles north of Winthrop, Washington. The fire was burning in the flat bottom of a steep canyon that was heavily vegetated with spruce, alder, aspen, fir, and pine trees, some live and some dead. This fire would later be named the 30 Mile Fire. This area was enduring a lengthy drought, and the moisture levels in large fuels were very low. The measure of potential fire intensity was near historic high levels for this time of year. In fact, another fire in the area, the Libby South Fire, was already burning over a thousand acres. You know, it involved setting up a, a local engine. Uh, they went up and, and checked the, the fire. They found the fire. It was bigger than they thought it would be. Um, and uh, so then they requested more assistance. Um, a support vehicle was sent up with, with hose and, and pumps and about the same time that the NEA hotshots were, were dispatched out of the Libby South Fire Camp. And they debriefed with the local district resources that were there. Those district resources explained what, what they could see, that there's spots across the river that they had not gone across the river, uh, but they had gone up on the hill to, to look across to try and, and see what they had. So they had fire on one side between the river and the road, what became known as the west side. And then on the uh, east side of the river, there were several spot fires. Um, in looking at the situation, the uh, uh, Marshal Brown, the Inuit, uh IHC superintendent, made the decision to send the local resources home, um, and that uh, he would then work his crew to secure the west side of of the, uh, the river, between the river and the road, they would secure that part of the fire and then work on the spot fires uh, across on the east side. We would probably be in a bed or den in our bags maybe half an hour when a vehicle drove up, had a discussion with Marshall, and I knew that something was going about to change. And sure enough, we need to get the crew up. There was a different fire that we were going to respond to rather than this big fire. Um, that was going on Libby Creek. So we were pretty, actually pretty pleased by that because, um, you know, incident management team and big show that was going on in Libby, having done plenty of that. It wasn't really, this, this sounded like a better deal working for the district uh, rather than an IMT. We we're going to go on this new initial attack um, up the Chiwa. So I'd been up there before. I knew it was good country, cool place to go. Uh, but it was towards midnight, so we were, I would say, getting tired. You know, we had been um, up at 6 a.m. the night, or 6 the, the, that day, 6 a.m., after a couple of easy uh, mop-up shifts. We weren't overly fatigued, but starting to feel like, you know, you, as you get longer into that day, you get tired, but it wasn't an inordinately amount. I mean, we didn't have a, a two-to-one at that time, and we had, you know, we'd had pretty easy shifts. We'd just refurbing and driving. It wasn't too big of a deal. Uh, we were concerned about the drivers and all those kind of things, people getting getting tired. And we knew that, that we'd have to factor that into our decision making at night shifts and lack of orientation and all the things that happen with night. So that said, we got up there, a uh, lot of smoke, the inversion had set in for the evening. It's pretty heavy, dense smoke, hard to see. But there was definitely, you could see where we needed to operate, at least in the short term. Close to us, there was a fire, the fire along the road with a big snag. Across the river, you could see another fire. And we had a, an interesting transition with the local forces who had initially attacked the fire. Um, they had gotten out there, assessed the situation, and I didn't actually get involved with that briefing between Marshall and 
the, the uh, initial attack resources. This, this particular time, um, rather than engage, which normally I would, I decided to talk with the crew and try to get things ready because I knew they were going to be tired and we needed to kind of get ourselves in the right mindset. So I let Marshall deal with that part exclusively. And when he came back, he said, well, we're going to let these guys go. And so they're ready for the next day. And we've got a little bit of fire here, a little over there, and another. They think they saw something out in the distance. So we knew there was more fire out there perhaps, but it looked pretty straightforward. A big snag was the biggest concern at nighttime. You're not going to be able to, to, to see anything, just fall that snag. So moving forward, um, you know, it was a pretty con confusing period. Again, the country not seen in daylight, all those kind of things come out. It was really smoky, uh, fairly tall um, riparian area, grass and shrub component. Um, you know, well, one point as I was trying to scout the edge of the fire, uh, in one of the spots anyway, uh, almost fell into the river because all you could see was the smoke and the headlamp right in front of you, which, whoa, you know, you almost, so it was pretty confusing. Had to wade the river as I was um, scouting out the spot across the river, found another one, then I started to see glows. So kind of just one thing led to another throughout the night was able to, um, ended up finding seven spots total, but it wasn't until almost dawn that I would say that we felt like we found everything that was there. Um, at some point, um, right before dawn, we took a little break, um, probably for a half hour to an hour, let people change their socks because everybody waited across the river, for the river. And he worked really hard. I was really tired. I remember we took a break in the crummies once and I was really wet, really cold, really exhausted and didn't want to go back to work. And I'd say that's not usually like me. I think we were, we were truly tired. <laughs> um, Was, the blind digging was confusing. Uh, it seemed like, uh, at least it was to me, uh, it seemed spotty. It seemed really wet. We had to wade across the river at points where it, it seemed like things were burning in the in the in the wet duff, and it didn't seem like a, a blow up scenario at one o'clock in the morning in the swamp. Is what it seemed like. At some point there, we had identified a crossing log, which made it such we wouldn't have to wade back across the river. Um, had a, you know, tactically had some people start to prepare that and figure out access and egress and all the things. And it kind of developed somewhat of a plan um, to try to, uh, to address their remaining spots. Uh, somewhere around nine o'clock or so, you could just tell the crew was starting to tire out. So we decided it was time to sit down and uh, slow down a little bit because we knew there were other forces coming, other, other people were gonna um, fill in behind us. You know, there were some communication issues with the repeaters, a few other complicating factors with, uh, you know, the, um, uh, I think one of the issues was communication between us and the local forces for whatever reason. The, the pickup that led us out there actually had pumps and hose in it. Um, unbeknownst to us, whether it was just breakdown of communication or wasn't said or we didn't hear it, whatever, we let them go. They went back with the pumps and hose and then promptly thereafter we put in an order for pumps and hose. So it just shows there wasn't, the communication wasn't real solid for whatever reason. We had basically three or four spots left to do, one over by the river, one by the hillside, and a couple of little ones we needed to pick up. But then we started in on that, and about that time the crew came, the NWR number six showed up, and um, that was a good thing, because we were been up over 24, 27, 28 hours. It's, it's probably time to start transitioning out a little bit. Um, call that good. So um, with that in mind, Marshall went back to tie in with, uh, with the incoming crew. At that time, also the FMO, um, Soderquist, and the forest fire staff, Elton Thomas, showed up. And so, you know, I don't remember feeling super surprised that they were there. But in retrospect, it's interesting that we'd have that much leadership on this small fire with a big fire going. But it just shows that, you know, they considered this to be a pretty important operation. Uh, well, it was decided as I worked my way out that I would give um, Campen and um, El Reese, Pete Campen and El Reese Daniels, a tour of the spots on the other side of the river. So I walked them through um, what I had seen that night before because I was the only one that had probably been to all seven spots at that time and um, showed them what I had seen. Um, at some point in there, I made a map um, with some software I had from my GPS to panned on that map, which ended up in the report, um, and you know, tried to give them as best orientation as, as possible. You know, 
uh, some of the, the human factor part of that was interesting is, you know, El Reese really didn't say much during that interaction. And so I hadn't, I knew El Reese, but I hadn't met Campen before Pete. And as we went through all that, he had a lot of good questions. He was certainly engaged and uh, it didn't, I did not know he was a trainee. I assumed he was the crew boss because he, he was not introduced to me as the, as the, as anything other than he, he was taking charge. Gave them the tour. Uh, Marshall got involved in some of the debriefing part, got the crew loaded up and, you know, nine or 10 o'clock in the morning, um, we plan was for us to go bed down for the rest of the day. I, I felt I was really experienced at the time of the fire and I've since through experience realized that I really wasn't very experienced. And, uh, and that was a perception I had of myself. Uh, one of the, the key points for me going into the fire and into the decision-making process, my frame of mind, um, I was 30. Uh, I was, I had just gotten a permanent position with the forest service. I was on my final crew boss trainee assignment. I, I really wanted to make a positive impression. I really, I wanted to prove that I was ready uh, to be a leader in the Forest Service and to, to lead a crew and to make, make key decisions. And that kind of plays throughout the day. Uh, my expectations were if, as I've made decisions, I needed to be confident with my decisions, but that the supervisors that I worked with would give me direct feedback and that if I were making a decision that may not have been a great decision that I would get immediate feedback to that. Pete Soderquist and, and Elton Thomas uh, also uh, took a hike over across crossing log and uh, did their own recon over there looking at what was there and what their expectations were and they were looking at what other resources they may need to order in. They made some decisions about putting in a spike camp so that they didn't have to travel the hour each way uh, back to town and looking at some of those oversight management things while they were there. Uh, once they were done with the, the recon, uh, they came back to the crew. Pete Campen went about uh, briefing his crew. Um, and uh, Elton Thomas and Pete Soderquist rejoined them uh, after their recon came in kind of at the end of that and uh, made sure that they'd used their briefing card and also that uh, Pete Soderquist brought a, a um, weather forecast, spot forecast that they had for Libby South that turned out to be really quite accurate for what their conditions were also. And asked if they had any other questions and um, he filled them in on a, the availability of the helicopter and uh, some of the other resources that, that they might be able to get. Got ready to get together with uh, the leadership, on-site leadership. So within the, I'm going to say the next five, ten minutes, we had uh, Marshall Brown, superintendent for the Indian Hot Shots. We had Elris Daniels, crew boss for Northwest Regulars. Uh, we had Pete Campen, crew boss trainee. We had Elton Thomas, Forest FMO, and we had myself, District FMO, standing in a small circle. Kyle Cannon, the uh, assistant superintendent for Indiana Hot Shots, uh, came out, uh, did a brief introduction, then he went back into one of the crew vehicles and uh, downloaded some GPS data and then joined us soon thereafter with topographic color maps of the immediate vicinity and where all where the point of origin was in seven spot fires and uh, it was technology like I hadn't seen yet actually. Okay we did kind of a, uh, a quick mental assessment of the fire. At the time when we arrived there, I'm going to put it now between say 9, 9, 15 in the morning, there was uh, real light fire activity. The area had uh, apparently been uh, covered by an inversion layer the night before or during the night. I know they had reported some active fire at times. I know that when uh, Engine 704 arrived and did its initial uh, size up, they saw active fire off some distance uh, to the north and east of the point of origin. 
Uh, but when we were there, it was mostly ground fire, low hanging smoke, uh, very little air movement. Um, I had heard from dispatch early on, earlier on, that uh, communications out there had been somewhat challenging throughout the evening hours with the Inead hotshots, and that they had found that the use of a human repeater in a mobile unit in the road uh, was the best way to maintain positive contact between the incident and dispatch. And so we talked about that during the uh, uh, debrief and the transition of command. Uh, it was at that point in time where my thinking was that uh, this would also serve as somewhat of a roadblock because before I left the fire ground that morning, I also contacted Okanagan Dispatch and I asked for a barricade to be brought up. I, as district fire management officer, don't have the authority to close a road, but I can get the ball rolling. Uh, basically, and that's what I was doing. I was ordering it up by going through dispatch. They could then go through the appropriate line officer and get the uh, get the order signed. Basically, what is what it was. We all got together. We did introductions. Um, I don't specifically remember introducing Daniels as the incoming IC. At this time, it was still customary for a crew boss to do kind of a double duty. Uh, IC and crew boss role, particularly when you've got a, a crew boss trainee uh, in tow and uh, one who in this case, like I said earlier, I was impressed with Campin's demeanor. He was engaged, he was asking good questions, uh, making good comments, taking notes and uh, seemed to be uh, you know, working under the watchful eye of a guy that I knew to be a division supervisor qualified anyway. I later found out that Daniels was actually a type 3 IC. By the time that Thomas and I got back to the vehicles, that log that had been across the road had been bucked and taken out of the road. And uh, uh, Cannon was gone. Campin and Daniels had their crew in a semicircle semi around uh, one of the crew vehicles there. I was at my vehicle as I was coming back out and I looked up, I could see that Elton Thomas was standing in the briefing circle with his Okanagan Wenatchee briefing card up, holding it. And so I'm thinking to myself, okay, these guys got a, are, are getting a thorough briefing at, at least. And so as I walked back into the circle to join them with the information I was about to hand camp and on supplies, uh, Pete asked me if I had anything to add to the briefing. And assuming that they had just used the Okanagan Wenatchee briefing card, I thought, no, probably not. I mean, after the recon, after the debrief of the leadership, and after seeing the briefing card, I thought, these guys are ready to go. Uh, there's nothing I can do to, other than I said, to you, are there any questions? So things progressed from there kind of on a normal basis. I mean, it was my third year, so I guess what's normal at that point in time? Um, a lot of the people were new, brand new, uh, either their first or second fire at most. Um, you know, and <clears throat> we, that year was kind of a shifting year. We combined forest as well. The Okanagan Wenatchee, I think it was that year, is either that year or the year before, but it was new. That was kind of a new thing. And so there's new, I guess, operating guidelines, new faces and all these different things. And, you know, uh, we didn't know anybody from Leavenworth for the most part. I met a couple people, Tom and I had been to New Mexico and Ty Taylor and, and um, so we had some working relationships and but for the most part that kind of first number of hours working with different people getting to know different people and you know you've been there so you understand that um so that we got a a, a thorough briefing i remember pete used that new newly that newly given out card of the okanagan wenatchee briefing card that had a million things on it you know and so he wanted to make sure especially because pete and the forest supervisor i think it was the forest soup was there to use that card, you know, this is it, we're going to do it. So we got a very thorough briefing, um, and we worked on uh, fix, fixing up the handline Inuit put in, went across the river, and ended up having to start putting in line. It wasn't, you know, I guess what a lot of us were under the stand, understanding that it was um, more in a mop-up phase, but, I mean, it wasn't a mop-up phase when there's not even line put in. Um, it was not knocking in yet. It was just dark when they were working, and when daylight came, more stuff popped up, and... Uh, 
So as the day progressed, we just kind of started realizing more and more that this was going to be something a little more than what we can handle. It was just a lot hotter. Uh, the brush was really thick. The line was really hard to dig as far as having a bunch of uh, roots and whatnot in it with brand new people. People smacking hoses, breaking those pumps going down. It was kind of a circus for a while. And it's, you know, second fire of the year or first for some people, their first gig. It's to be expected. Um, so that was kind of the way things were going throughout the day. Uh, morale was good. I mean, I don't think anybody, as far as I know, had too many qualms with things. Um, the one confusing part for myself for a while was who was, ex you know, overhead. I guess Pete was the trainee for crew boss. And at one point, I remember him being told and telling us that he was also the IC trainee at the same time, and back then that was something that was a little more uh, acceptable. And so that's what that was one, I guess, first kind of heads up for me was, you know, who, who I'm working for ultimately. But in the, like I said, it was my third year. How much of a heads up was that? You know, I can look back and say that now. But uh, anyways, it was something that struck me. Uh, so throughout the day, it was hot. We were taking a lot of breaks, um, having to, you know, fix hoses, fix all that stuff, and and just never able to catch up. And at one point, I remember Tom Craven and myself walking ahead. And like I said, I was a squad boss back at the district, but I was newer as that in that position. So I was like gleaming on to him and learning a lot of stuff from him. And so he took me out ahead of the fire and we uh, walked out to this Aspen Grove. And I remember smoke clearing, excuse me, and, and looking up the hill on the east side of the river and just seeing fire over there now. And we're like, oh man, it's that's it that's the final straw you know so well, once they engaged um elton thomas and pete soderquist headed out uh they had meetings to go to down at uh the high school for the libby south fire and uh northwest regulars uh started um well they checked the lines that had been put in on the west side of the river they all look good, secure, so they started moving into a line building on the east side on the spot fires. They put in a hose lay. They had troubles keeping a pump running. Uh, they were breaking hose. They were breaking tools. They, they had one problem after another with equipment as they engaged. By the time they got engaged and, and put their lookout uh, up there was a Talos slope there that uh, that they, they put uh, Donica up on as their lookout. Once they got up there and she took a weather, they were already, um, their temperature was in the high 80s to low 90s and, and their humidities were down to 9 and 10 percent. So they were already really dry by, by shortly after 12 o'clock. Fire activity was picking up. Um, they were getting flames now, uh, they started getting uh, occasional torching, they were starting to get spotting, and uh, so it was all they could do to, to keep up with that. And they're trying to build fire line in riparian areas with lots of uh, roots and difficult digging. And the Inuit hotshots had said that too, it was tough digging. Uh, just because of the the nature of the uh, the roots and the plants in those riparian areas, so that was difficult. And and looking back, uh, they they were requesting more help. Uh, they were asking for more resources. They were having troubles keeping up with the fire as it as it came to life, and started to spot. And uh, it was not moving quickly. Uh, there was no rapid fire spread going on, uh, but it was persistent, and um, it, it boiled down to them just not having enough resources to deal with the amount of fire that they had. Uh, as they would work to contain one spot, another one would start showing up, the crew was getting exhausted uh, because it had been such tough digging. Um, they had abandoned their hose lay uh, because it was not being effective. So I said, let's at least get the uh, the line secured. I remember cutting, and I remember the flame lengths being four to five feet, and 
getting real hot, you know, so I, I knew the fire was actually, you know, it was, it was picking up and uh, definitely working for the money then. And uh, so um, as we continued to work uh, and the fire behavior started picking up more, we had ordered uh, a Mark III pump, so the pump finally arrived and uh, I was tapped to help set up the pump and run the pump and we we're having lots of troubles running the pump um, for whatever reasons the pressure was wrong we kept blowing hose and so we kept having to go back and fix the problems with the pump um, so at that point water was pretty critical and we weren't getting it because we we're having so much trouble with the pump and uh, after a while um, I was tapped to uh, go down and wake up the Indian hotshots that were a few miles down the road sleeping because they've been working the fire all through the night and uh, so they're down there sleeping and at this point we knew we needed help with just the 20 of us it was a little more than what we could handle uh, as far as getting ahead of the fire we'd get in line around it and so uh, um, Pete Camp and crew boss trainee at the time taught me to go wake up the hot shots and tell them we need their help. And so I drove down the road and found where they're camping and uh, pulled down into the campsite and everybody was in their skivvies. You know, it was a hot day. Um, it was midday when I went down there and I was tiptoeing around. Everybody was asleep and finally found the Marshal Brown, the superintendent. He was under one of the trucks and uh, woke him up and I felt really bad doing this obviously because they were exhausted but I uh, woke him up and said hey Marshall uh, we're gonna need your help up there it's a uh, fire's taken off on us and it's a little more than we can handle so he said okay all right I'm gonna give uh, the crew a few more minutes to sleep and we'll tie in with you so I said okay jumped in the truck headed back up to uh, tie in with the crew and um, at this point, I grabbed the saw again and started, um, at some point, we went from direct line to indirect line. And uh, so by the time I got back from waking up the hot shots, we're going indirect. And I, I remember uh, going up ahead of the crew quite a ways and cutting line, and the diggers were still way behind us. and. Um, I noticed uh, as I was cutting, I was seeing all these little spot fires, you know, amongst the aspen stand where I was cutting at the time, and I was like, "Oh, that's interesting." You know, this fire is getting a little more active than I than I thought it would. And um, about that point, uh, can't recall exactly who made the call, either El Reese or Pete Campen, but. Uh, they made the call to pull back um, to the lunch site where we're having lunch and uh, a couple hours beforehand. So uh, I remember pulling out and I was up ahead of everybody and I remember walking back along the line that we had just cut back to the lunch spot and all these spot fires, probably about 30 of them all around me and I thought maybe I could just stomp out a few of them just so I could do something at least and instead of just walking away from it. So stomped out a few spot fires as I was walking away and um, went across a log across the river to our lunch spot we were directed to um, you know have a bite to eat and refurb, refurb our tools and I, I think we finally um, after we got some lunches and did a few things I found a spot it was probably 11-ish and it was hot, and I remember I didn't sleep at all because it was just too hot. Even in the shade, it wasn't a place where I was going to find them. You know, I just couldn't. I would sat by the river for a while and tried to cool off. And anyway, the point being that it wasn't good sleep. We didn't really get much sleep. And um, I was back in my bag, kind of laying in the shade again, trying to trying to get some sleep when another vehicle rolls up, which again indicated something was about to change. And um, Sure enough, it was one of the crew members from NWR number six, and they needed help. And so, you know, I, I walked over there and talked to Marshall a little bit, and we kind of made the decision that we were going to 
spend a little more time here letting the crew get a little more rest if we could before we went to help not knowing what their situation was and i definitely remember thinking oh come on right really really there's nothing up there right nothing what, you need help seriously by the time we got loaded up it was probably two ish 230 and we drove out of where we were camping came around the corner there's a, a fairly significant corner where you could turn around and get a view and Here's this column starting to build and the fire was obviously up on the hillside. So that was kind of the first indicator that something had changed significantly that we, you know, I was picturing what we had seen when we left and that really wasn't what was happening and they definitely needed help. So we get over there, uh, parked where we had been, walked up to uh, where everybody was at, lunch spot, and um, it, well, they weren't there yet, but we walked across the log, later it became a lunch spot, but we walked across the log to find out what was going on. The crew was still in the vehicles um, and, uh, you know, started scouting out what we had going. And there was definitely things had changed. Fire behavior was real active. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the, that mixed conifer, 80, 90 year old mixed conifer was, you know, spotting, building, building, torching, spotting, you know, probably every 10 or 15 minutes and each each torching event was definitely causing more and more spots as, as you could see them building around you and then building in intensity. Some point in there, saw a squad go by us, go back across the log with Tom Craven and I knew him. He you know, kind of gave a little nod and he went across the log. Um, you know, at some point in there, Pete Campen came up to me, Marshall and I were standing out there kind of watching the fire behavior. We got a squad leader on the log. Pete Camp came up to me and said, well, there's nothing we can do here. It's kind of beyond us. You guys got it. And I remember saying, there's nothing really to get here. There's spots everywhere. There's no place to anchor. I, I didn't say that last part, but that's what I was thinking was, you know, things were definitely changed significantly. And we did not have, there were no opportunities here, really, that I could see. Um, spots everywhere, really. I mean, hundreds, I would say. They hung in there uh, very persistently trying to, uh, to contain these spots and to get it secured. Uh, right up till the time it made that run and uh, they had called back the anti out of hot shots they came back up and uh, looked at the situation just as the Northwest regulars made the decision that we need to get uh, pull back and and withdraw and get back uh, to the lunch spot what became the lunch spot across the crossing log and they felt that was a safe area to to be as this fire moved up the slope away from them. Um, there was an air attack out there, uh, Gabe Hasso, who also had had been in his career uh, previously uh, the superintendent of the Indiana Hotshots, well known on the district. He was also worked on the, the district that El Reese worked on. So there was a, a you know, he was well known, well respected in his abilities, and, and now he's overhead flying air attack. They tried to get some retardant in, it was ineffective. Um, and they just couldn't get down into the canyon far enough with it to, to do them any good. <clears throat> um, they were able to engage eventually with the, with the helicopter, but that was uh, really too little water too late. Um, and, and really, at any time, I, I'm not sure that the little bit of water that you can get out of the bucket of that particular helicopter, that, that it would have been enough to do them a lot of good. Um, because uh, they were, the fuels were so dry and, and the fire behavior they were seeing in that riparian area was, was more than they had anticipated. Um, so they, they ended up withdrawing. Um, the, uh, Kyle Cannon and, and Marshall Brown went over and looked and they agreed, yeah, there's really nothing that can be done here. This, this fire is taking off. It's, it's just time to pull back. So they, they all pulled back to the lunch spot. Um, the general impression um, that I have gotten talking to those folks was they were done firefighting for the day. They had done the best they could. They couldn't get the extra resources they needed. The other thing that happened was that there, the engines were ordered. Um, now there's, to this day, some confusion as to exactly how all of that happened because you had a communication problem 
getting out of that uh, that canyon uh, on the radio and so they were using Gabe Hosso at Air Attack, as Air Attack to relay messages back and forth. Um, at one point dispatch called Gabe and said we've got some engines available would you like to have those? Um, Gabe indicates that he had checked with El Reis and they said yeah send them up. We ordered a couple air tankers, the air tankers come in there was a helicopter that showed up with a um, bucket um, to drop water. Um, we were trying to find a place for the helicopter to drop, but it became an, uh, a problem because they were the water. The waters were being because they were raising fish there, so they wouldn't let them dip. So the last thing I remember is the helicopter made one water drop and it left. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a seat and a big air tanker made a couple um, retardant drops and they disappear. Um, once the fires uh, blew up. There was a lot of road traffic on the road, which the road should have been closed down. Um, we had private vehicles with horse trailers and um, people driving up and down this road. And I just wondered why this road hadn't been shut down with the situation that we already had there. Um, didn't didn't get an answer from anybody. So I tried to deal with with the situation the best I can I could. Um, Pete Campton pretty much handed it back over to me, um, and it was pretty much in my hands. And so there was a, well, I think there was three engines from the district that showed up. They tried to help. Um, there was no use for them because there was nothing they were going to do and stuff there. So every time we talk about that reengagement from when we did the walk through with the. Uh, with the investigation team to last week when I walked through with Kyle Cannon and Pete Sotoquist, I get different perspectives on what different people were thinking during that process. And I get different insight from how things got ordered. And, and just every time it, I get a different idea of how that happened. Um, I, I've accepted that I was kind of the catalyst for, well, one of the catalysts for it happening. Uh, but it it starts with early in the day ordering resources and not getting them. And so in the morning we're ordering, you know, uh, crews, we're ordering, we're, we're, we want whatever we can get to come up and help with the fire. Um, at some point, some engines are made available. And, and you would have to talk to Pete Sotoquest and Gabe Hasso about how all this transpires. But the two engines become available and um, it's relayed to Gabe and Gabe says, go ahead and send them up. Um, and from my perspective, Gabe from the air attack platform had ordered them and, and Gabe, the AMFO, AFMO of my district, a great guy I've worked with a lot, you know, worked with several shock crews. I mean, if Gabe's ordering engines, I, great, we'll take the engines. And we've been trying to order engines all morning. so. We're finally getting some resources. Uh, the way that engines were dispatched, the way uh, Harry Dunn was told, is that he was going to come up. He, his orders were to come up the canyon and, and look for spot fires. Um, when we were informed the engines were coming, we were informed that two engines were coming up to check for spot fires. We weren't. They weren't coming in to check in with us. They weren't tying in as a resource for us. They were coming up to patrol for spot fires. So my understanding of the engines uh, sitting on the ground was that these two engines were going to show up and patrol autonomous of us. We could still be disengaged and then pull out, and they're kind of working on their own. And, and that's kind of what the engines thought, too. So when the engines came through and did their, their check-in, which is another point of, of debate on how that actually went down, um, they talked to... They didn't talk to. They waved at El Reese, and and they went on their way to check the fires. Uh, in my mind, they were on a different mission, and they were doing something completely different. Uh, apparently, when the engine was requested, dispatch said that they were to go up and patrol the road for spot fires. And so they came with the assumption that they already had their orders. 
Um, and uh, so the engine 701 and 704 were dispatched and proceeded on up. Um, they also brought the road close sign, put it in place as they came in. When they reached the origin of the fire, uh, they stopped, they conducted their own briefing between the two engines. And uh, engine 701 or 704 personnel got out of the engine and spaced out their personnel between the origin and the lunch spot and were patrolling the road on foot for spot fires. Engine 701 drove up to the lunch spot. Everybody was congregated there. Um, they uh, stopped at that lunch spot. Uh, the engine supervisor got out uh, on his running board, looked over the top of his engine, uh, pointed over to L. Reese, and, and uh, L. Reese was talking on the radio to the helicopter at the time. And uh, the engine uh, supervisor said, uh, we're going to go up the red road and check for spots. And L. Reese nodded. And so that was his check-in on the fire. But he felt as though he already had an assignment that it wasn't necessarily a need to, to check in and get another briefing. So he heads on up the road. At some point, I remember sitting in the ditch and a couple of engines came up and we had to jump up real quick and get out of the road, not like they were going to run us over. But I mean, we got up and I remember, um, you know, talking to the guy and he was asking where's El, El, El Reese or somebody. and. I guess they had a real quick briefing and those engines just sped on up the road and so we were wondering at that point, so what's, what changed? What's the plan now? Um, so all of a sudden, some people are engaging and a lot of people are sitting around and then nobody's getting a briefing on what's happening. Uh, so it turns out that they were from the local district and they got dispatched up to go do that and I headed on up the road and shortly thereafter. Uh, a couple squads ended up being called, myself included, to head up the road to a system and putting out spots. I definitely have some strong recollections of sitting around in the lunch spot. I'd had a, I had a discussion with Tom Taylor because we'd done some timber cruising and timber stuff together. Um, you know, I didn't know many people that I knew of El Reese. I'd never met Camp and like, like I spoke of. Yeah, I definitely know, um, remember Barry George coming in and having a discussion, and I know Marshall participated in that. I didn't. I was with the crew at the time, and um, definitely have a, a vague. Re well, I shouldn't say definitely. I have a vague recollection of an of an engine coming into the mix, um, and I know later on when I saw the engine up Valley, I was not surprised to see it. But at the time, I had a real hard time remembering any kind of anything associated with the engine, whether that was stress related, I'm sure, or whatever. Um, interesting, but. So all these things are going on. Everybody's kind of sitting around, sharpening tools, eating. We were definitely, I know Marshall and I had this, had no intention of taking more action on the fire, really. We knew that there was a lost cause. It was going big. Um, you know, the pictures show, and I definitely remember seeing a really large well-developed column moving its way up that slope um, well beyond the capabilities of the force we had there. And even then, with 10 more crews, taking action and that kind of fire behavior on that kind of ground is not something we're going to do. So, and then you've got Barry George up there that, you know, he stops and talks to us and says, Hey, it would be great to keep the fire, you know, on this side of the road. And, and I think everybody understood that as, as a suggestion. And that'd be, that'd be nice to do, but there was no formal plan. There was no discussion on how to do it. It was just, something that may happen later in the day it may happen with us it may happen with the engines you know it's just this idea that the fire needs to stay on the other side of the road if possible and if safe and then there's a uh, kyle cannon and, and marshall brown going up to the end of the road to check for uh to check for campers and, and make sure no one's stuck at the end of the road uh, you know they head up the engines go by they head up and then there's a call for some a squad to come up and assist the engine with the spot fire. You know, that, that call comes down to us and you know, what are we going to do? We're sitting around in the lunch spot. We've got the resources. There's an engine asking for the resource. Yeah. You know, we can loan them. We can loan them a squad. And I, you know, asked Tom Craven say, Hey, how do you feel about heading up the road and, and helping the engines out with the spot fire? 
And he's like, yeah, I'm in. And he, he gets in and there's no, and it, at that point, there's no real discussion about a re-engagement. There's no formal plan for a re-engagement. It's just kind of happening one little step at a time that, that and it all seems very uh, reasonable to be doing. Around sometime around this point where we're breaking for lunch, refurbing the tools, uh, an engine had gone off the road to put out some spot fires. The whole objective was to keeping it uh, keeping east of the the road, and uh, so the engine needed help putting out some spot fires. So um, P. Campin gave the call to load up in the vans, head up the river head up the road to put out some spot fires and help the engine. So I had two more teeth to sharpen. This was a big twist of fate for me. Um, I had two more teeth to sharpen on my saw and uh, after he'd given that command to load up and go help the engine. And uh, so by the time I was done sharpening those two teeth, grabbed my saw, went to go load up in the van and by that point um, another Sawyer had jumped in that van and uh, this is the last words that Tom Craven spoke to me but he uh, I went to go load up and uh, he looked at me and he said sorry Wallace the van's full uh, we were sharpening tools and cleaning saws and watering up and refurbing so to speak uh, I was pretty much helping a young man learn how to sharpen a chainsaw and I got a call on the radio to re-engage and head up the road to a spot fire. You know, we got up to one engine and asked if they needed assistance and they said, no, we're fine. You may want to head up the road. So we headed up the road to where the second engine was and engage that spot fire uh, with the incident commander and the crew boss um, and Tom Craven's squad. And we started digging line around that spot. The long and the short of it is we end up, Marshall and Kyle are coming down and I'm in the van heading up and the three of us have a conversation. Um, uh, El Reese has gone out to check out the spot fire. Harry Dunn's doing something. Uh, Tom Craven and Tom Taylor are getting their crews ready to, to you know, mop up these these spot fires. Uh, you know, and Kyle Marshall and I are sitting there and saying, well, you know, what are we going to do? And and Kyle let me know that Marshall and he kind of thought that it'd be good to just not do anything. and. I was kind of, and this came up too, I previous in, previously in the year taken a tactics class from Kyle and Marshall. So I'm sitting here with these two guys that had just taught me this tactics class and I kind of, you know, I want to, I want to say something smart. So I say, you know, why don't we spread out along the road and, and we can hold the road between here and, uh, and the heel of the fire, you know, here in the, the point of origin. And Marshall said, well, I wouldn't spread out any further up the canyon. And I said, oh, I agree. I don't think we should get any more spread out. And there was an agreement there that we could safely spread out from the heel of the fire to, to the point that Harry Dunn's engine was. And we, we had the discussion on how to lay the resources out that INEAT would tie into the point of origin and we'd tie in from them and we'd extend along the road and we'd try and hold the road. Uh, you know, in hindsight, that given the fire behavior, the size of the fire, what it was doing, it, it was fairly pointless for us to, to engage in that tactic. But I think, I think everyone there thought, well, it's pretty pointless, but we can do it and it's not going to be unsafe and we'll be doing something. I mean, and there's that, you know, the worst thing you can do to a firefighter is ask them to, to sit still, you know? And so, you know, everybody kind of wanted to be doing something and, so we ended up with this idea to spread out along the road with no idea of the, the consequences it would cause. And I remember Camden saying, oh yeah, and by the way, there's a couple more spots back behind me. And, and I definitely remember Marshall and Lincoln going, whoa, really? <laughs> that changes things significantly, right? Here we've got 
we're, there's some exposure going on here. And, you know, um, in retrospect, I think, you know, Arsha would say the same thing, that that was definitely an opportunity where we perhaps could have made a significant difference in the incident. But, um, you know, we're coming back, we're not really sure what the plan is. Marshall's not the IC. I'm an IC3 trainee. Elrice is in charge. You know, there's that whole dynamic between hot shots and IA and ego and all the things where, you know, we kind of, there's sometimes resentment that can happen. And this is a forest crew. We know some of these people. So, you know, trying not to be too domineering, but I know we both felt like, whoa, Andy just got up to be in this game and this is not so great. But uh, as we um, went back down Canyon, we looked at those two spots. They were five by five or whatever. And not super active or anything. You know, we drove around the corner another quarter mile, got out, briefed the crew, talked to them a little bit. They loaded up. It's probably five minutes, if maybe 10 max, before we came back up around the corner, um, where eventually the fire was where they get where they got cut off. And it had changed. It was building. You could see they were 20 by 20, and things were building and changing. And um, I, we turned around and got parked. The crew was doing their thing, turning around. It takes a little longer with the crew carriers. And as we got out... It was, you could just feel things were changing. It was building rapidly. Um, an engine pulled up and was starting to do some stuff, kind of half parked in the road, which I remember thinking, you know, the hell, we're, you know, you could tell, feel things kind of getting out of control. Spots are across the road, and I actually had my shovel and threw a couple in the road and then realized that wasn't making a lot of sense. Um, and the spots on both sides of the roads were, were building rapidly. And, you know, at that point, I, I remember Marshall. Um, getting on the radio and saying, hey, you guys need to get out of there. A um, couple, three times, hindsight, they were actually on their crew channel, and Campen was talking to them, and Campen was right close there as well with another squad. Um, and I do remember, you know, at some point there, right right as it all kind of transitioned into a crown fire, those Campen's van coming out and then the engine coming out. I think there's some photos of that, that they're moving away. Um as we're loading up, but you know, the transition was pretty quick from we show up, it's 20 by 20, it's building within a minute or two, it was transitioning fully into a crown fire. And I mean, I literally was on the, on the radio as I'm doing things, picking a few spots going, yeah, why don't you guys um, go ahead and get geared up and uh, hold up. You know, it's like <sighs> taking off going over. Harry Dunn describes to me, uh, what he saw. Now Harry and I had worked on, together on the the, uh, the district in, in prescribed burns for years and so I, I clearly understood what he was describing. He said as they stood there getting ready to engage on that last spot, um, the river is about a stone's throw. I mean it's, it's very close to that particular location on the road. And just across the river, there was a little flat area, and there was a stand of timber there, and it was engulfed in crown fire. And this had been described by several other people also. The wind was at their backs as they looked across the river, up at the fire going up the hill. And he says, we in the report were accused of being at the head of the fire. We really felt at that time like we were at the rear of the fire because the wind was at our back. It was burning away from us going up the slope. Up the east, east side. East yeah. side. Okay. Yeah. And uh, he said, so we were just about to engage the, uh, we were watching this fire go up the hill, the wind was at our backs, and then we had a column collapse. And that's how he described it. Well, to me, that, that meant when we burned clear cuts, we would develop a convection column uh, to draw the heat in from both sides. And we would call it a column collapse when the heat went out of the unit and um, the convection column would essentially stop as the, as the surrounding air would try and return to its ambient conditions prior to us developing that convection column. And it's always a difficult time because you get air pushing out on all sides of the fire for a period of time until it, it reaches that uh, previous condition. And so he said when that happened, the wind direction changed and the smoke column from that 
that crown fire across the river came over the top of us and it deposited an amber shower and we looked around and we immediately had hundreds of spot fires uh, starting up and and um, Pete Campen said it was a situation where we didn't have to say anything everybody knew it was time to go at the time my van load um, came and tied in with the engine actually the engine was already driving down the road as we were going up to help him out and so I'm like well there goes the engine um, so we pulled up to a spot where the engine was working this last spot and uh, I remember Pete Campen who was with me in that van and uh, we got out of the van and as soon as we got out of the van, we stepped outside and there weren't any spots anymore. It was just a wall of fire as, as far as I can see. At this point, with a few choice words, um, Campin said, get back in the van. Um, we're heading out here. So we didn't even engage at that point. We, as soon as we got out of the van, we were back in the van. So we threw all our gear in the van, did about a 12-point turnaround, and started going really fast down the road to uh, try to get out of there because the fire was pushing our position really hard at that point. We got a call from Marshall Brown saying that we needed to head back down the road to the lunch spot. Um, another minute or two went by and we got another call with uh, more urgency behind it saying that we needed to get back to the lunch spot. So we loaded up the van Tom Craven's squad um, started running down the road. Uh, we drove by him in the van and got up to a portion of the road where the main fire had crossed the road and made the decision that we weren't able to drive through it. So we turned around, picked up Craven and his folks, and we headed up the road. And then about that time, that's when things kind of went the hell in a handbasket. It's just, um, I remember we all, at one time I was driving one of the vans and I had a bunch of people in the van and, and then I had some more people walking right alongside the van. So the situation got really bad and um, ended up getting, putting everybody in the van that I had and went up to where the, further up the road from the fire. But one thing I remember is uh, the fire was so intense, it was reached, it reached across the road, about 150 foot flame to stretch across the road. And my thought was that maybe I can just go ahead and run this, run through the fire with the van, but something that says, don't do that because, you know, I'm gonna endanger people more than what we're already are here. So I ended up turning the van around, and then there's another van already parked up in another spot in kind of a, big white spot in the road where we just hung out. So my perspective is that I thought that we could just hang out here until things calm down, we could get out of here. Um, that didn't happen. Things were getting a lot more serious as far as fire behavior down Canyon. It was time for us to disengage and drive back down. And so at that point, we wrapped things up um, and got back on the road, started driving back down. But because we didn't have enough seats for everybody, and the way that it was portrayed to us was it wasn't like it needs to happen now. It was you just need to hurry up and just, you know, make you start making your way back. That um, myself and a couple others started walking down the road behind the van. And then at some point uh, we kind of picked it up a little bit. And then we turned a corner to see a wall of flame going across in the entrapment area. Um, and the van's reverse lights on doing a 20 point turnaround. So we turned around and started running back up the road to where. Um, El Reese came up and picked us up and we just arms and legs hanging out the van, hopped in and started driving up to <clears throat> to the deployment site. And on the way up, we had a decent conversation really amongst the whole group of, you know, kind of what's going on and we need to maybe looking for safety zones or anything like that, you know. So we discussed wetter spots along the creek side, just rocky areas. So we had at least a discussion started of that we weren't blind to the fact of what was going on. Um, so we proceeded up the road to the actual um, deployment site and then I think it was kind of a unanimous that this was 
this was going to be it between the rocks, the bend in the river, kind of an open spot in the timber and the brush. So um, that's where we stopped. Uh, AirTac identified a spot that looked viable for them to um, uh, wait it out. And uh, so initially I thought, you know, they weren't in any harm's way. Um, they had a safety zone and uh, they were about a mile and a half away from the fire at that point. And so there was, for me, there was no sense of in, impending doom or any sense of real urgency other than that they couldn't make it down the road. And um, I did not know that it was a dead end road. Gabe Hossel was, was flying AirTech. When they disengaged at the lunch spot, while they were disengaged, they had to refuel. So he went back to uh, North Cascade Smoke Jumper Base. They went back for fuel and lunch. He came back and was surprised to hear that now people were becoming entrapped because he had no idea they were re-engaged. He immediately gets drawn into this situation, uh, starts giving L. Reese directions on where he might find a place to to uh, sit this thing out as the hopefully the fire burned around them. They looked at a couple of spots on the way up and uh, they didn't like those particular spots so they kept going and uh, they finally arrived at, at the final deployment site. Uh, it had a lot of things going for it. It had a big talus slope there on the west side of the road. Then you had the river and the road came together. You also had a huge rock slump that filled up the the basin of the river. Um, 800 to 1,000 feet square. Um, and the fire was on the other side of that that rock slump going across the hillside. And uh, so El Reese checked with Gabe and said, what do you think? Gabe says, yeah, this looks like your best spot. There's one more above you, but I think this one's better. And so at that point they decided this is where we're gonna wait this thing out. Okay, so we're at the deployment side. Um, Pete and uh, Marshall and Kyle and all those guys, uh, El Reese, were talking significantly, you know, back and forth on the radio. Gabe Hasso was overhead. Uh, his air attack, he had limited uh, vision just because the amount of smoke and the tight canyon and all that stuff. Um, and so they were talking back and forth about how the situation was and whatnot, a lot of talk. And, you know, at that point, you know, yeah, we got into our groups of who we knew at that point, Natchez people kind of hanging out with Natchez people and so on. Um, so... Tom Taylor and I had already known each other, even though we weren't on the same crew, and we talked a little bit about, you know, if this is where we're going to end up doing this, then we need to maybe do some brush work or something. You know, we talked about cutting some brush out on the other side of the river, maybe falling some trees, something, you know, if nothing else, it was busy work and keep people's minds off of this, but uh, but it would have helped, you know, and, and so I guess ultimately there wasn't really any conversation of what, what the plan is, what are we doing here, you know, there's a lot of talk back and forth about what the big picture was, but not what are we doing here. Um, so that was something that um, was lacking. And then uh, at some point myself and a couple other got up on the rock, which has come to be known, uh, and looked back east and we could see a lot of really good fire behavior. And I remember Tom Craven sitting there talking about how things were going and why and all that stuff. And it was neat at that point. Uh, but then I kind of, like throughout that whole thing, I kind of had that uneasy feeling like, you know, this isn't, and sure, it'd be great to see her and take pictures, and we can say that that might—that's most likely what's going to happen. Maybe trying to convince ourselves of that, but you know, reality, I think you kind of knew that that wasn't going to be the case. Um, so we're sitting on the rock, and uh, you know, people are walking around doing this and that. And then, as time goes by, uh, there just really wasn't any more organization at all. I just kind of—I don't even know where Elrice went and, and whatnot. And um, uh, at some point you could just kind of see and feel the atmosphere changing as far as, you know, the fire was getting closer and just everything. Um, just that awkward, eerie feeling that things were happening. Um, and so I remember myself and Karen Fitzpatrick and a couple people, you know, sitting on the rocks and Rebecca Welsh and Rebecca decided to go back down to the road. Um, and Tom Taylor was, you know, a little further up on the rocks, like trying to, uh, he was up higher than us trying to look around and see what was going on. And, uh, at some point I remember looking, you look across the canyon 
<clears throat> and see fire and you look down canyon and you see smoke and just kind of this rolling smoke you know doing this going up the canyon and thinking wow that's that's pretty impressive and then all of a sudden there's a little ridge from where we were sitting um, that kind of keeps you from looking directly down uh, road and all of a sudden fires are now on this side of that ridge and that's really when it got real was oh well now it's on this side of the road too I mean the last thing we knew all we knew was it was over there so now we got a problem. Now it's on this side, and it's just spotting into everything that's available as far as fuels to consume. And so now, as far as fire behavior, you're looking at two fires. You've got the main one that the crew is standing in awe, taking pictures of and watching as it advances up the hillside. Uh, incredible fire behavior. Uh, just blankets of fire going up the hill. And uh, things they've never seen before. And then when you look down the canyon, and you can see it in the pictures they took, you can see the smoke from the entrapment fire. So it is now coming up at them. And the main fire is going around them. And effectively what you have on these two fires is the main fire is becoming plume dominated. It is, it is beginning to dominate that environment. It's creating these indrafts. I think it was 20 miles an hour clocked by the helicopter. The, became quite stronger later and now the entrapment fire coming up and based on the photographs that we see that Gabe took at the time uh, the entrapment fire is now wind driven fire being drawn up into the main fire with these 20 mile an hour indrafts also combined with the up valley up valley winds Tom Taylor uh, decides he wanted to get a better look and he's wondering if there's a better place to be so he starts to climb up on the tallest slope on the west side of the road um, and again the rest of the, the crew is milling about now the Hagemeyers show up and they say gosh we were at the end of the road we saw the smoke started getting concerned and the crew informs them well we're entrapped and so are you you need to change into some long sleeve clothing and and pants they had on shorts and short sleeve shirts and there's no extra shelters for them uh, there's no briefing that is done with them um, but they become a part of the event um, now they start to get El Reese starts to look up in the Talos slopes where Tom Taylor has gone and he starts to see smoke there's a smoke here and a smoke there uh, evidently there's an ember hitting here and there and is finding fuel out in that Talos slope of log and and uh, at any rate Tom Taylor reached the point where he said yeah the road's a place to be so he's headed back down to the road well, he, he gets part way down and they start to get this ember shower. And it starts to snow fire. And so it's bouncing off their hard hats and it's bouncing off their clothes. And so El Reese has them get their shelters out and wrap themselves in their shelters to protect them from these embers. As they're doing that, uh, they get hit with a, a blast of convective heat. So he orders everybody to shelter up. That blast of heat hit so hard it knocked Tom Taylor on his butt coming down from the, the rock slope. He picks himself up. Of course, he turns away from that heat and hollers deploy and starts running back up the Talos slope. Um, and then at some point, it just happened like that. And so it, it was on the other side of the river, pretty much right across from us. Things were spot right around us. And so it was more or less... Uh, I guess a, I don't know if it's a organized panic as far as our little group. We had Tom to kind of control, you know, what we were doing. We just kind of all moved to this little single unit down below. I'm not really sure how that all worked out because when it happened, it happened. And um, and so we decided to turn around and Tom started yelling everybody to run uphill, Tom Crib. And so Tom Taylor was already up a little further. Uh, we started running uphill and I remember just the the panic of, we need to go because you can see from where we deploy if you look up a rock band of like cliffs and whatnot there was a lot more sparse with vegetation than uh down in the valley bottom where we were 
And I remember thinking and Tom saying that if we make it up there, we got a pretty good chance of being fine. Might have to pull some shelves over just to kind of cover ourselves from some ourselves from uh, embers falling, but we'll be all right. I mean, there's really nothing to burn up there. Uh, but I mean, you're looking at it, and it's quite a ways up, and that's a it's a far hope. Um, but so I remember pushing Karen on her bottom, pushing her up the hill, like yelling at her to get going. Um, but because of just the way that the wave of heat hit us and we weren't going very far. So we went up, whatever it was, 30, 40 feet. And then ultimately that's just kind of where we ended. And I remember Tom Taylor yelling, time to deploy shelters. And so we got ours out. And uh, at that point, the wind was blowing so hard. The second real big thing of, well, this is really real. I'm getting in my fire shelter, you know, and this is happening. And so I remember getting in there um, and I didn't have the best seal underneath. I mean, the rocks are, are large rocks and you know, there's really no flat spot. In them. There wasn't really any vegetation where I lay down at all. Uh, Might've been some little pieces of bark just cause it's an old you know, area, but deck in an area that hadn't uh, burned for a while. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to think here. So yeah, Jessica was the closest to me. Tom was, fairly close and I could hear them talking and at one point I heard a, a scream and it was Devin and that was a real kicker too like wow what like what's happening out there you know and so um, I remember laying there just struggling to keep my shelter down because my hands were like trying to hold things down and my elbows too were you know touching the shelter so they, they were burning um, <clears throat> and so I remember a big like football sized chunk coming up on the right side, um, up underneath the right side of my shelter, of just this big burning, you know, not an ember at that point, a big chunk of burning material. So I remember grabbing it with my right hand without a glove, and I remember lifting up my shelter and saying, Getting, get this shit out of here, and I threw it, and at that point, like I, I had the opportunity to lift my shelter up and look around, um, and I could see the other shelters and just how bad it was out there. <laughs> and so then I thought to myself, well, I guess I'm in it now, and things are kind of quiet around. I don't really know what else is going on. And so I remember sitting there thinking just a million different thoughts, you know, and thinking, you know, uh, like, well, they always say stay in your shelter no matter what, you know, and they always, you know, say all these different things, and you never get get out. And so I just remember thinking, well, then I'm just, I don't have gloves. I'm not in the best situation. I just saw what it's like out there, so I'm just going to stay here take a deep breath, close my eyes, relax, and then, you know, wait for it to go over. So I, you know, I basically started doing that, and then I started realizing what I'm basically doing is just preparing myself to die. Take a deep breath and relax and close your eyes, and you're in the condition you're in. Like, this isn't working, obviously. Like, my hands are killing me. Um, I can't hear anybody. I know what it's like outside. It's it's just didn't going to work out. So I decided that I was done being in the shelter, so I decided to lift up lifted off and announced to the other guys who were there uh i'm i'm leaving like this isn't working out and i had no response it was just that i mean as loud as it was in the environment it's quiet it was just eerie calm quiet uh, so i kind of had the idea that they weren't you know they weren't gonna be following and so um, i ran up the hill another 15 or 20 feet i saw this big rock uh, it was like half the size of a volkswagen bug I decided in my head that what I needed was shelter um, of something, you know, and so in my head, that was the next best spot to go as a shelter. So I went up and stood on the uphill, upriver side of that, um, and I can, for a while there afterwards, you can still go up and see my bloody handprint sitting there. And so I was able to sit next to that and kind of recollect my thoughts and figure out what's next, what's the next move. Um, you know, looking back, obviously it wasn't shelter in any way, shape, or form, but mentally. And so as long as that worked, that worked. And that's I knew that's what I needed was just something that was going to help me mentally figure out what was going on, what I needed to do to keep moving around. Um, so then as soon as that really hit me, it was like, well, this isn't really shelter. I mean, it got me from point A to point B. Now I need to get out of here, too. Um, so then I ran further up the hill, up the rocks, to kind of get advantage of what was going on, to get a big picture scenario of, the road where the van was if the river was a good option all this stuff um so i remember looking down and seeing the van sitting completely intact um i could see the river kind of through the smoke um and then uh, there was this huge log that was laying uh 
perpendicular to the roadway that was just completely engulfed and my only and that was over to the right of me a little bit um, and then where everybody else was deployed was over to the left and if I was going to go down to the road which I decided that's that's where I need to be it's either go up further around the rocks and all the way around big rocks that you're like leaping over and over or just say screw it and I'm going straight down in between that log and I remember going down at some point I I think I fell because I found my glasses up in the rocks and that my sunglasses up in the rocks in that area I don't remember falling <clears throat> um, but it was there up in the rocks I remember stopping for a second collecting my thoughts and thinking my mom is gonna kill me but I'll be out in a couple days and I'll be back and then I remember holding up my hands and looking at just like these milky white hands with like cheese coming off of them and, and um, I had a metal bra a silver bracelet on that more or less melted in my wrist, and that's what the tattoo is the same design. Uh, but it was like melted flat into my wrist, and I remember shaking it, thinking, "That's kind of cool, but that's really not that cool. Um, I need to get out of here, you know." And so that was, uh, I guess, a snap back to reality. So I ran down uh, the rocks, um, went straight to the van, completely intact. Um, I didn't see anybody else laying around because at that point in time they had already gotten down into the river. Essentially, we had two plume-dominated fires burning on each side of the drainage and that collapsed right on top of us. And the folks that were on the road, you know, came away fine. We had three people in one shelter. For those of us in the rocks, you know, the outcome wasn't very good. You know, I got in my shelter maybe 20 seconds before those folks did. And Jason was, uh, Jason Emhoff was, you know, the next one in the shelter. So that's just that short time frame was enough to protect our airway. Whereas the other four weren't so fortunate. You know, from my standpoint, I thought we could drive out the other end of the road. And it was the Hagemeyers that told me it was a dead end. So that was kind of a bummer. Um, from my experiences, every road leads somewhere. Oh, we'll just drive out the other side. Well, that wasn't the case. Uh, when I was getting into my shelter, <clears throat> as, you know, fireballs are raining out of the sky, I was in denial. This is not happening to me. There is no way I'm getting in my shelter. This isn't happening. And then I'm in my shelter, and I'm starting to feel the effects of a column collapse in a crown fire and hundreds of years of needle cast in the rocks starting to catch on fire underneath me. That's in, I was in denial. The people on the rocks, everybody wants to know why did they not go down the road? They're not going to go down into the face of that convective heat that's blasting them now that knocked Tom Taylor down. It drives them up the slope. They turn and they are pulling shelters out and as soon as they can they deploy the shelters. So you have um, Tom Craven and Jason Emhoff and Devin Weaver and Jessica Johnson and and uh, Karen uh, Fitzpatrick uh, go up in a group and as soon as they can they deploy their shelters and climb in and they're in a pretty tight group there and then Tom Taylor is just uh, a, a little bit uh, down canyon from them but up the slope a little bit above them so he's got a little more separation. The rest of the people deploy on the road, and it's um, a fairly chaotic event, and, and you can see that in the diagrams afterwards, that they aren't lined up, uh, a couple people take packs into the shelters with them, uh, but they all they all get in, and, and the, uh, the Hagemeyers uh, jump in with Rebecca Wells. She just happened to be there, they climb in with her. And she has quite a chore keeping them calm and in that shelter. The first van load pulled down the road, and uh, the first person got out was Rebecca Welsh. And so I uh, came up to her, and I was like, Rebecca, what do you need? And she, she asked me for some pants from her red bag and a little doll, that, a stuffed animal that she kept as good luck in her bag. And so she wanted that. So I grabbed those things out of our, our trucks and gave it to her and um, I saw um, Scott Scherzinger who was another Sawyer um, he got out of the van as well and I said hey Scott you know where's where's Tom and the other folks 
from our squad and all he could say was it doesn't look good man it doesn't look good I'm like what do you mean it doesn't look good where are they and I uh, said so they they can't find them it doesn't look good I don't know what to tell you so uh, it was at that point where I I figured that something bad had happened um, and it wasn't until Pete Campen um, took an inventory of the folks who were there after all the, everybody who, who had just deployed came back down the road and uh, that's when um, he confirmed that there was four missing you know because we we're parked on the main road to like see the van go by and it's like you know who's in the van who's uh, who's not in the van who's dead and who's alive kind of thing and and I, I remember that the word fatalities has been had been used on the radio um, and and it was like which ones are they the idea of an entrapment of fatalities is not a real thing until you know it becomes real to you and it, it became really real all of a sudden um, and when I study fatality reports um, there's there's some recurring things that you see and and one of them is that firefighters are surprised by how fast things go bad and how fast the fire overtakes them and they also say they saw fire behavior they've never seen before initially um, right after the fatalities I remember thinking to myself um, you know there's not even a question in my mind that I'm going to stop doing this because I knew the inherent risk involved when I signed up to fight fires in the first place. Um, was it a surprise to me that those four out of my out of the six of my squad perished? Yes, it was. It was a huge surprise. Um, but after the fact, I, I remember telling myself, you know, like you know, I'm I'm going to stay in fire. I'm going to do the best I can to learn as much as I can from other people's mistakes and be the best crew boss I can and be the best leader and, and lead firefighters um, into fires and keep them out of harm's way. And that was my goal right off the bat. I remember thinking that to myself when I was in on the bank of the river just after I found out they had died. And, um, I, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, how can this happen? Um, such a benign fire at first, and then six hours later, um, four of my friends are dead. And um, over time, after um, I thought that you know those four would be the only ones who would die, and um, over time, as we, as the agency instituted more of a safety culture, people still were dying fighting fires, and. Uh, I came to the realization that um, it's a dangerous job um, as long as the agency and other agencies keep putting uh, humans in the line of fire, uh, people will continue to die, they'll continue to be accidents.